Hello, uh, this is SK Williams, and this is an unscheduled video because I can't speak freely on the platform any longer. So, if you will skip ahead the requisite quarter of an hour, then I shall get to the point of this video. But I will tell you this much. It is actually a reply to comments that I ought to be able to post freely, but can't. My posts vanish, and I must use code language and odd spelling in order to get them to remain. So, for now, just skip ahead in the silent section of the video for 15 minutes. But keep in mind, I will be using your from your from your from your from your from your in order to uh, get this across.
Hello, uh, this is S.K. Williams, and if you endured the silence or simply skipped ahead, I thank you. Today's topic is one that I would normally not make into a topic. I would leave it in the comments sections. But my comments vanish, and I'm limited to only doing two or three sentences at a time. And I have to use creative spelling. And given my channel has been threatened with deletion, and I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing wrong, I have elected to continue the conversation in this venue. Uh, the topic is a common historical myth within the holy religion of atheism. And I will remind you, or tell you if you've never heard the term before, I don't use the term the holy religion of atheism because I think atheism is a religion. I don't think atheism is a religion. Atheism is not a lack of belief in a god. That's a lie that is told simply to get atheists out of the burden of proof. But it is not a religion. Atheism itself is not a religion. But the holy religion of atheism refers to atheists who make their identity around what they think an atheist is supposed to be, and is really just secular humanism being repackaged. And even the people like Alex O'Connor or Drew McCoy, who claim to have abandoned humanism because they value all life equally to human life, really just have humanist values and beliefs, they just don't like the term humanism. And ultimately, it's the belief system itself that matters. Because hiding behind the label of atheist and insisting we define atheism as a lack of belief in a god, so you can say you've made no claims and have no burden of proof, it's just cowardly. But it is what I expect. However, another myth that you commonly hear is the myth that the atheists are freethinkers. In fact, even the new atheism wasn't really freethinkers. All they did was repackage other people's ideas. And I got in trouble saying that, too, because I was told that these are four separate writers. The four horsemen were four separate writers, writing separately, each with an interest in what religion does to humanity. And the media just exposed a deep interest in the population with their works. And this was after I mentioned that they were paid propagandists. And they were. But the guy ignored, of course, the evidence against that. The evidence is very simple. By the way, all four horsemen of the four horsemen of the new atheism, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and Daniel Dennett, they all quote each other or cite each other's books in each other's books. So the idea that these were four lone wolf individuals arriving at similar conclusions, writing in books independently of each other, is itself ridiculous, even if you just read their books. All four books also had the same literary agent, John Brockman. And uh, they were all connected to the Edge Foundation. And they were all ultimately financed by a man whose name I can't mention because it is verbotum. But I will say it sounds a lot like Jack Ebstone. But therein lies the point. There is an obvious organized movement around a certain secularist belief system that produces literature and calls to action and has events and conventions and who has leaders telling people what to think and feel and that run tax-exempt organizations. And yet we're supposed to believe none of that is true and people just lack belief in a god and have nothing else in common with each other, even though there are like-minded individuals. And the reason this is important here is because the people that I was talking to were quoting some well-worn myths that obviously they got from the four horsemen of the new atheism. Myths about Charlie Chaplin and the party. And incidentally, I will be using euphemism, 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 and to clear that up before I go any further, Charlie Chaplin is not talking about the movie actor Charlie Chaplin. I'm talking about Charlie Chaplin from the movie The Dictator. And when saying that, I don't mean the fictional character he plays, as if I just forgot his name and I'm using the actor's name. I mean the person he is supposed to be parodying, whose name I also can't mention for some reason on this platform without getting into trouble. Ah. Uh, the nation he ruled will be called Jerryland. The group of people he didn't like 
and wished to be disposed of, they're going to be called the elves in this particular video. And I will be referring to certain organizations like the double S. And as needed, I will introduce a few other euphemisms, which I'm hoping you are smart enough to realize what it is I'm talking about. Oh, having said all that, let's get started. It's the usual rubbish. And it's obvious they're getting this rubbish from the divine prophet Christopher Hitchens Most Holy. Hallowed be his name. Hallowed be the name of science. Hallowed be the name of reason. Hallowed be the name of no God. And the divine prophet Sam Harris Most Holy. Hallowed be his name. Hallowed be the name of science. Hallowed be the name of reason. Hallowed be the name of no God. And it is equally obvious uh, that they don't actually question whether or not what the Divine Prophet Christopher Hitchens Most Holy or the Divine Prophet Sam Harris Most Holy said was actually true. They are people who are... They are the Divine Prophets Most Holy, after all. They speak for science and reason and no God. Everything they say is true and right, just by virtue of them being who they are. The problem is, of course, that I don't follow their cultic religion, and I've actually studied history. I've actually read Charlie Chaplin's book, This Struggle of Mine, and I have actually read many of his speeches and listen to them both in the original language and in English after being translated by Intelligence Synthetica. So a lot of the claims that are being made here are just bunk. And before I get my words twisted, I would like to point out I'm dating a Jewish woman and I do not hold the ideology of the party. I read these things because I am interested in history, not because I like the party and fancy myself a member of it or promote its ideology. I know how atheists tend to be, so I have to put that disclaimer in. Having said all that, it's the usual rubbish. Charlie Chaplin was, was a Catholic. Not only was he a Catholic, he was a devout Catholic. Not only was he a devout Catholic, but the Catholic Church adored him, loving everything he did, and approved and endorsed of his policies. So much so that they signed a concordance with him, or an agreement, proving they gave full approval of his party and its platform. And indeed, the party platform was nothing more than writing church dogma into law. And of course, that includes the hatred of the elves, for you see... The Catholic Church taught that the elves were the purest form of pure evil for centuries. In fact, anti-elvenism was official church doctrine for centuries. Indeed, even after the horrors of the Second Great Conflagration, the Catholic Church retained its official teachings about how evil the elves were and how they had been the ones to kill Jesus and only changed their official teachings in 1964. This, of course, was stated as a matter of fact, and it is not a matter of fact. Indeed, while this topic deserves a good deal more attention than I'm going to give it, and a good deal more of a serious voice than I can give it, I will attempt to go into greater detail and provide more actual evidence in the later video. Nevertheless, I feel confident that I can name certain names. And one such name that I feel confident in uh, mentioning is Calixtus II, Pope Calixtus II, who, around the year 1120, gave us Secut Judaeus. Secut Judaeus is a series of papal bulls that defined uh, the idea... It did not say they were all killers of Jesus and guilty forever and 
uh, come up with all sorts of things about their inherent nature being evil or them being parasites or what have you. Indeed, it forbade forced conversion, it forbade any mistreatment, it forbade any abuse given to them. And while I am not saying that uh, no anti-Elvinism existed throughout medieval history or early modern history, I'm not even saying that people who called themselves Christians didn't do this. It simply cannot be laid at the feet of the Catholic Church, since the Catholic Church officially condemned that sort of treatment in around 1120 AD. And it's not like they condemned it in 1120 AD and then changed their official doctrines. Or should I say changed back, because I'm pretty sure the atheist community will insist that prior to 1120 AD they officially taught his doctrine anti-Elvinism. Then this guy, Calixtus II, comes along, changes their official doctrine. Then when he dies, they change it back. Because that's how atheists typically argue. If proven wrong, they try and salvage the overall narrative mythology that they have by patchwork. But we know in this case that Secut Judaeus was reissued several times and expanded upon. Throughout church history, mistreatment of the elves was strictly condemned by the papacy and strictly condemned by the popes and by the church itself. So it simply is not true that uh, the Catholic Church had centuries of anti-Elvinism. Of course, at this point, someone wants to bring up Martin Luther on his book on the elves and their lies. But at the same time, I was talking about the Catholic Church. Even if that point were valid with Martin Luther... It really wouldn't matter to Catholicism, would it? And your entire argument is that Charlie Chaplin was a Catholic. Why would he be listening to arch-heretic Luther? Of course, I've actually heard atheists say that he did, and some even go so far as to say that Luther was a personal hero of, of Charlie Chaplin, all while insisting Charlie Chaplin was a devout Catholic, which makes no sense. And keep in mind, though, I will get to Luther in a moment, but... Even if that claim about Luther were true, it wouldn't matter anything to the Catholic Church. And it wouldn't prove all Protestants were anti-Elvish. It wouldn't even prove the Lutherans were. You'd have to prove that they maintain that belief. Uh, but therein lies the point. Because, you see, the Catholic Church had already condemned the sorts of treatments that Charlie Chaplin gave the elves. It simply isn't true that it comes from them. Having said that, if you actually read on the elves in their lives, which I have, by the way, uh, Martin Luther is perfectly okay with elves converting to Christianity. So long, of course, as it is his own form of it. He wouldn't particularly be happy if they uh, converted to Antichrist religion, and he did consider popes Antichrist. Not THE Antichrist, because... Martin Luther was not a dispensationalist who thought there would be this big, this guy called the Antichrist at the end times. He was referring to it being just opposed to Christ. Nevertheless, the Vatican is Antichrist in Martin Luther's writings. And Martin Luther was not actually anti-Elvish. He was more... Anti-Elvenru, the religion of the elves, as it were. And I hate using that term because the concept of religion we have today is actually new, but I can get to that in a later video as well, for the sake of convenience. There is a difference between being anti-elvish and being anti-Elvenru, and the difference being one opposes the religion and the other opposes the race. Luther did not have a problem with the Elvish race. And should someone of the Elvish race wish to convert to Christianity, provided again that it was his own approved version of it, he would be perfectly fine with that. And even all of the things he said should be done to the elves, such as their property confiscated, tools confiscated, uh, not walking unescorted, things like that, wearing special clothes to identify them, None of that would have been true 
had they converted. Of course, now I'm going to get the usual atheist reply of, Oh, so that makes it okay! Because delusional, stupid atheists tend to actually think I'm approving of behavior when I'm explaining it and giving a historical commentary. No, I don't think it makes it okay. But at the same time, it makes it very different than a racialist concept, which is what I'm getting at. Which brings me to another point. The atheist community, of course, frames the entire discussion about whether Jerry Land was religious or non-religious. And they believe that they're citing real history where Jerry Land was deeply religious, one of the most religious countries in Europe. I, of course, am an apologist, and I'm arguing that Jerry Land was not religious. Jerry Land was atheist. And, of course, that's not how I'm framing it. That's an oversimplification. That is a reductive logic. What I am arguing is that the anti-Elvinism did not truly come from Catholicism or even Christianity, but rather came from the progressive movement. Which is exactly where the modern-day atheist movement itself came from, since modern-day atheists are, well, largely liberal progressives, and largely are that way simply because they do not merely lack belief in a god. They claim God doesn't exist and hide by that excuse and then push a bunch of secular humanist nonsense on us. And of course they quote the divine prophet Christopher Hitchens most holy, Hallowed be the name of Christopher Hitchens! And that is how they treat him, because a lot of the claims that were made in the video, and again I will go over them again on the other place, but a lot of the claims were just false. For example, they used the usual rubbish about Jerryland uniforms having God is with us on them. The difference is they actually said, one of the posters actually said that this was specific to the double S. It was the double S uniform that had God is with us. And the double S, according to him, was distinctly Catholic. Of course, there's no evidence that the double S was distinctly Catholic. They just say that. The only piece of evidence they had was that a garden camp, according to him, one of the garden camps where they put the elves, the only person who guarded a garden elf, a garden camp, whoever got into any trouble was the one that married a Protestant, proving that they were indeed Catholic. Proving the double S were all Catholic and expected you to be Catholic. And this one double S man, working with the camps, married a Protestant and got in trouble for it. This is why we know he's actually quoting the divine prophet Christopher Hitchens most holy, because this myth came from him. But the myth was not about a double S agent, and certainly not about a guard at a garden camp. Rather, it was about Gobbles. Joe Gobbles. Who was the official propaganda minister for Jerryland under the party. Uh, but even then, it's not actually true. Uh, but th th before I get into why it's not true, I would like to discuss this. This is what I mean. What you're listening to in these conversations is third-hand, watered-down mythology. They read on some atheist website, or perhaps even read the books by the Divine Prophets Most Holy, Hallowed Be Their Names. But over the years, they've kind of forgotten the details but still feel confident reissuing them, even though they don't know them. It went from Gobbles being the only party member to get into trouble and him for marrying a Protestant to being the distinctly Catholic double S having a guard at a garden camp getting in trouble for marrying a Protestant. <coughs> and of course... 
none of that's true. Either way you go with it. For one thing, the claim made by the Divine Prophet Christopher Hitchens Most Holy, Hallowed be the name of Christopher Hitchens, was that none of the party members were ever excommunicated by the church save one. And that being Joe Gobbles. And Joe Gobbles was excommunicated not for his role in uh, unaliving millions of people, not for his role in creating an authoritarian dictatorship, not in his role for spreading terror over the world, but for the high crime of marrying a Protestant. And the entire point that the divine prophet Christopher Hitchens most holy hallowed be his name, O oh, sacred speaker of science and reason, was that the Catholic Church was evil, and obviously approved of all the evil that the party was doing, since it obviously didn't condemn people with excommunication, even though all the party members were Catholic. And the only one that got in trouble, got in trouble for some stupid reason, for marrying a Protestant. And that's a lie. In reality, the uh, Jerryland bishops had actually excommunicated everyone in the party, in the year 1934. This excommunication was modified from a general excommunication for all party members uh, sometime later simply because party membership became mandatory. Now, some atheists like to say, oh, they had a little tiff, but then got over it. It's not that. The church actually actively opposed the party. The Catholic Church was actually one of the first groups to oppose the party. The reason for the emendation of what was done was simply because once membership became compulsory, once you needed to be a party member to work in most types of jobs within Jerryland, then the Church felt it wrong to punish people for something they had no choice in. However, the excommunication actually remained active. It was modified, not repealed. Meaning, all the ones that had been excommunicated prior were still excommunicate. And it also means that anyone who chooses to join the party, willingly, because they agree with it, would also incur excommunication. What's more, the Catholic Church does not excommunicate people for marrying Protestants. That was not really something they do. It is true that Gobbles created a bit of a controversy for who he married, but it wasn't because she was Protestant, it was because she was divorced. However, by that time, uh, he had already been excommunicated from the Catholic Church for several years, and did not care. Which brings up other interesting myths that they don't really have evidence for, but they think they do. Uh, like the claim that the Catholic Church officially celebrated Charlie Chaplin's birthday every year. It was an official church event. They officially celebrated Char Dear Leader's birthday. Charlie Chaplin's birthday. The church celebrates it. Well, unfortunately, no, they didn't. The church did not celebrate Charlie Chaplin's birthday every year. That's just nonsense. Rather... The Catholic Church prays for basically everyone. And the Catholic Church did pray for and note the birthday of all leaders of all the countries it was in, regardless of what country it was. You had Catholics living in the Soviet Union who were who did basically the same thing. For Josef Stalin. This was not really some odd event which shows their deep love of Charlie Chaplin and approval of all he did. It was just something that Christians have always done because Christians even pray for their enemies. But what about the concordant, the agreement that the, the Vatican made with? the Cherryland with the party. Doesn't that 
approve when they signed an agreement with Charlie Chaplin that they approved of everything he did? Well, no. The reason for the concordant was because there was hostility between the party and the church. And the goal from the church's side was simply to protect itself from further aggression by agreeing to certain concessions. The reason for the concordant wasn't to show approval for the party and how it was running Jerryland. It was simply to protect the church's rights. And, of course, Charlie Chaplin ignored the concordant and continued to abuse the church. So, it really wasn't the smoking gun that people think it was. Even the belt buckles with God with us, that was actually the Jerryland motto for its army since 1799. Of course, at this point, we come along a patchwork, which is what atheists do when their mythology is contradicted. And they'll say, well, he may not have added it, but them it being on their uniforms means they believe it. Which is as silly as thinking if a dictatorship were to take over America, it must be one that believes in God, because in God we trust us on the money. In fact, it's worse than that. They think God is with us on the army uniforms proves that they were Christian. Because, well, I mean, look, God with us. They must be Christian. Well, not necessarily. Even if it did prove they believed something, it would only prove they believe in God. It wouldn't necessarily prove they believed in Christianity. For some bizarre reason, atheists think that Charlie Chaplin was either an atheist or else he was a Christian, as if there's no other options. But in this case, it proves nothing, since it was an institutional slogan. It's no different than going to a courthouse in America and seeing the goddess Themis there. And that is who that statue is. There is a statue in a lot of courthouses, or on the front lawn of a lot of courthouses, of a blindfolded woman holding in one hand scales and the other hand a sword. Well, that's Themis, the goddess of justice. Just because Themis shows up on courthouse lawns or within courthouses does not mean that the United States of America is filled with Greek pagans worshipping the goddess Themis. Some things are retained purely for cultural reasons. The party in Jerryland was not as stridently atheistic as were the Union of Soviets. But that doesn't mean that they were Christians. It doesn't even mean they believed in God, really. Not that belt buckle. Of course, one of the posters mentioned how spelling God with lowercase g as the way to virtue signal his atheism to his co-religionists in his tribal religion. By the way, God is used as a name. Note, I said used as a name. I said used as a name, not is a name. So it should be capitalized. And yes, I know, God is a title, not a name. The God I worship is named Yahweh, not God. Here's the thing. We capitalize titles when we use them in place of names. And what's more, God is not actually a title. But I'll move on to that later. Nevertheless, the poster also mentioned that Charlie Chaplin mentioned God and Christianity and how he was a Christian in every speech. Except he didn't. I've read a lot of his speeches. I'm not saying that he didn't mention God or Christianity in any of his speeches. One of the things I hate about talking to atheists today is that they think that they can make a statement like, Charlie Chaplin mentions God and Christianity in every speech. And if I say that's not true, that he did not mention God and Christianity in every speech, that all they have to do is find one speech where he mentions God or Christianity or both, and then say, See, you said he didn't mention God or Christianity in any of his speeches, but he clearly did. I'm not saying he didn't mention them in any of his speeches. I'm saying he didn't mention them in all of them, or even most of them. He did several speeches, and most of them don't mention God or Christianity. It's irrelevant that he mentioned in, that God and Christianity in some. Most weren't. And even most of the famous quotes, which I won't repeat here because I'm afraid of getting stricken, weren't really saying what people think they were. There's a famous one where, for instance, he said, My sense of the Lord is that he's a fighter. And atheists love that quote as proving that he saw himself as a Christian without realizing the context. 
He was actually talking about this other bloke, who I also can't name, who said he cannot be anti-Elvish, because his Christian faith won't allow it. And according to Charlie Chaplin, it could. It was a polemic against what this other bloke had said. This other bloke said that Christianity does not allow you to hate the elves, and and Charlie Chaplin was trying to curtail any influence he had with those words. It's not proof that Charlie Chaplin was deeply and sincerely Christian, much less deeply and sincerely Catholic. Which brings me to another problem. You see, the mythology is that the Catholic Church approved of everything that Jerry Land policies were doing and, uh, under the party. Uh, but that clearly can't be true. Uh, because the party believed in forced sterilization, for instance, and eugenics. And I know atheist websites like to pretend it was the Christian churches pushing the pseudoscience of eugenics, and it was atheists, agnostics, and deists who realized it was pseudoscience and opposed it, just like it was the churches pushing racism. But it turns out that the atheist groups were pushing the racialist sciences and eugenics. Uh, people like Joseph McCabe... Uh, Carl Pearson, John Draper, one of the men who gave us the science versus religion myth. He was a eugenicist. He was also a Marxist. Uh, Joseph McCabe, George Bernard Shaw, Charles Bradloff. Indeed, you really can't find any atheist pushing for... Uh, the secular ideal who wasn't pushing for you, Jigs. Even Bertrand Russell did. And keep in mind, this video I'm on has Sam Harris saying that the party was not real secularism, and part of his reasoning was that it was a religion, a form of religion, and it wasn't the type of secularism that Bertrand Russell wanted. But Bertrand Russell, while he didn't agree with all of the specific actions taken to achieve the ideals, held all of the same beliefs and ideals and principles that the party held, and that the Union of Social Soviets did. And I know that sounds weird, because they're supposed to be on opposite ends of the political spectrum, where the Union of so so Social Soviets was a far left-wing, and the party was far right-wing. But in reality, the party was more left-wing itself, because factism and partyism are actually forms of the same socialism. But at any rate, the party's policies were actually built upon things that came out of Britain and America, with people like Madison Grant uh, and Harry Laughlin laying the groundwork for Charlie Chaplin's policies and ideals. And these policies and ideals were consistently, since the 19th century, condemned by both the Catholic Church and the Church of England. Indeed, the divine prophet Joseph McCabe, most holy, hallowed be the name of Joseph McCabe, uh, even noted this in his own works, where he hated the Church for holding up eugenics, saying that they were the biggest enemy and obstacle to them. Which brings up another interesting fact. If the Catholic Church was openly supportive of the party, and if the Catholic Church openly agreed with what they taught and, and approved of everything, and if, and if Charlie Chaplin were indeed a devout Catholic, you would expect books at the time, from the 1920s and 1930s to reflect that, where you would have church books that openly praised Charlie Chaplin, that you would have all sorts of Christian literature talking about how great he was, and you don't. Just like you don't have atheists talking about the church supporting him. In fact, Joseph McCabe, one of the biggest atheists who hated Christianity with a passion, he was once a monk himself, even he noted that there was open hostility between the party in Jerryland and the church. He, of course, tried to put negative spin on the church's motives, which I will go into later. 
But if Joseph McCabe, in his Blue Book of Atheism, which you can read on Internet Infidels, admitted that the church was subject to hostility in Jerryland, and the party was hostile to the church, and if every single source you get, whether written by an atheist or not, says that the church decried the policies of the party, then it seems odd, because if the church was so openly supportive of the party, why aren't they praising, why aren't they pointing that out? Because some of these atheist sources did not like the party. They were favorable more to the Soviets for national unionism. And therein lies the problem. If even the atheists who hate Christianity at the time are saying that Jerryland was hostile to the church, or rather the party in Jerryland was hostile to the church, then what actual evidence do we have outside of a few out-of-context disjointed quotes and a few bizarre stories that cannot be shown to be true that they actually supported them? I'm going to do another video on this later, but for now, I will leave it at that. My voice is beginning to hurt from doing the comical voice that I have to do to make these things go through. I shall take my leave of you now. Thank you. God bless. And goodbye.